Summary of Daniel Jurgens' The New Map As climate change, new dynamics in energy, and an international struggle for power shake up the world, a new global map is emerging. The overall relationship between Russia and China on one hand and the United States on the other is shifting from political engagement to strategic rivalry in what is starting to look like a modern-day Cold War. In the new map, 2020, energy expert Daniel Jurgen explains how the shale revolution has altered America's position on the global scene, upended global energy markets, and reset international geopolitics. The Shale Revolution Geopolitics mainly focuses on rising tensions and the shifting balance of power among nations. Global energy as a whole reflects wide-ranging alterations in flows and supply, mainly driven by changes in the U.S. position in the energy sector, the role of renewables, and the new climate politics. Three different types of power are at play. The first is the power of nations shaped by geography, military capabilities, economics, grand strategy, calculated ambition, suspicion, and fear. The second type of power stems from coal, oil, gas, wind, solar, and splitting atoms, while the third type comes from policies that seek to reorganize the world's energy system and reach net zero carbon in climate's name. There is no clear power map that can be followed, for it is constantly changing, dynamic. It has grown even more complicated due to the coronavirus that has caused widespread disarray and suffering. The coronavirus highly affected the global economy, leading to the worst recession since the Great Depression. The pandemic disrupted local and international commerce, destroyed businesses, increased public debt, intensified international tensions, and caused serious turmoil in energy markets. Solar and wind were both innovations of the 1970s and 1980s, but so far in the 21st century, shale gas and shale oil have become the leading energy innovations. The U.S. has surged ahead of Saudi Arabia and Russia, becoming the world's leading gas and oil producer and one of the world's leading exporters of both. Although some politicians call for its ban, the shale energy revolution has supported economic growth in the U.S., enhanced trade, created job opportunities, increased investment, and lowered bills for millions. Shale supply chains reach all throughout the United States, enriching the job market even in New York, where shale development is forbidden as a result of environmentalists' opposition. Wide-ranging impacts The shale revolution enabled the extraction of oil and gas from unconventional sources, such as shale formations, through hydraulic fracking. As a result, America's position in the energy sector started to look different. Natural gas production grew dramatically. The same was true for oil, as imports, along with the money spent on them, decreased. However, the shale revolution had an even wider impact on the American economy. In 2014, Ben Bernanke, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, labeled the shale revolution as one of the most beneficial developments that the U.S. economy had witnessed since the 2008 financial crisis. The nature of economic flows intensified this impact, and the growth in economic activity generated by shale oil and gas, along with a drastic decrease in imports, affected financial links and supply chains across the American economy. This was quite different from money flowing out of the country in support of foreign development or ending up in sovereign wealth funds. The internal circulation of money dramatically intensified the impact. Between June 2009 when the Great Recession ended and 2019, Fixed investments in the gas and oil extraction sectors amounted to more than two-thirds of America's total net industrial investment. The increase in gas and oil accounted for 40% of aggregate growth in American industrial production. This represented money turning into paychecks across the country. By 2019, the unconventional shale revolution was already supporting more than 2.8 million jobs. Shale development has not only increased revenues, but also generated opposition and environmental controversy especially concerning water contamination and methane emission. As with most massive industrial activities, environmental issues attributed to shale production must be properly managed. U.S. Strategies in Canada and the Middle East The United States and Canada occupy a major place on North America's map of energy. Canada has witnessed a rapid production growth from soil sands, owing to remarkable technological advances, especially in the province of Alberta. From 2000 until 2019, crude oil production more than doubled in Canada, reaching approximately 4.5 million barrels a day and surpassing Iran and Iraq, before sanctions were imposed. While some of the production is consumed in Canada, most of it is exported to the United States. 
In 2019, Canadian oil imports accounted for around 50% of total U.S. oil imports, three times more than all the oil the U.S. imported from OPEC countries. The growth in Canadian imports greatly contributed to U.S. energy security. This mutual trade is also a core element of the $600 billion trading relationship that has been established over the years between the two massive countries. The Middle East remains a central player on the global oil scene, and the safety of its supplies has been a top priority for U.S. foreign policy and crucial to the world economy. In 1950, at the outset of the Cold War, as Saudi oil exports increased, President Harry Truman assured Saudi King Ibn Saud that any threat to his kingdom would form a major and direct concern to the U.S. Truman's commitment aimed to protect Saudi Arabia's resources from the Soviets, but it persisted, even after the Cold War. The current U.S. safety engagement with Persian Gulf countries is reflected in numerous agreements, exchanges, deals, and several facilities and bases for ground, sea, and air forces. The nature of the U.S. commitment to Gulf security, the massive size of the resources available in the region, and the scale of American engagement, have led to a widespread belief that the U.S. heavily depends on the Middle East. Yet that's not true. In fact, in 2008, Gulf oil imports accounted for less than 20% of aggregate U.S. oil imports, and by 2019, only around 11% of America's oil imports came from Gulf countries. The U.S. commitment to the Gulf and Middle East has persisted not because a certain number of oil barrels must depart from there, for U.S. refineries, but rather because the Gulf region's resources are crucial to the world economy and America's main trading partners and allies. The Russian Map More than 30 years after the Soviet Union collapsed, the world has been witnessing a global competition between Russia and the United States. This modern-day Cold War is reflected in regional disputes, and it affects cyberspace, information warfare, energy, and general relations between the two countries. Since interfering in the U.S. presidential election in 2016, Russia has become a sensitive subject and a source of great hatred in American politics and Washington in general. For more than two decades as president, Vladimir Putin has aspired to reassert Russia's control over former Soviet Union countries, restore its position as a great global power, establish new alliances, and fight the U.S. impact on the world. Whether Russia is involved or not, Putin has achieved some goals that support his long-term objective. American politics polarized and fragmented, the European Union in disorder and NATO divided. Gas and oil have been crucial to Russia's return to the global scene as a major political power. They have also projected its power far more than any military might could. The obvious fact that Russia has greater possibilities than any other country is reflected in the abundance and scale of its energy resources. It is the second largest natural gas producer, the largest gas exporter, and one of the big three of world oil production. Russia's natural gas exports to Europe, which amount to 35% of Europe's gas consumption, form the center of a geopolitical crisis, and nowhere are these tensions more flagrant than in the violent relationship between Ukraine and Russia. The consequences resonate on relations with Europe and the United States, energy markets, the U.S. military budget, the domestic discord regarding the 2016 presidential election, the growing hostility between the two main nuclear powers, and Donald Trump's 2020 impeachment trial. Western and Eastern Strategies The political threats around importing gas and oil from Russia have formed a subject of debate for a long time. The United States was greatly alarmed by the flow of Soviet energy exports to Europe in the 1950s and 1960s. American politicians have warned that Russia was aiming to drown other nations in a sea of oil to facilitate its conquest of the world. In 2016, Trump came into the presidency resolved to follow a new course with Russia. In his campaign, he had complimented Putin and called him a strong leader who had praised him as a genius. Yet in Washington, after Trump won, Russia's intervention in the election became a dominating subject, and the corruption and authoritarian nature of its government became a common refrain. In an effort to act, Congress imposed sanctions that targeted individuals close to the Russian president, along with companies and financial institutions. The goal was to hinder Russia's energy projects and stop Western participation in them. Further to the east, Russia's comedy with China grew more remarkable given China's advance into Central Asia. In the years that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union, Moscow insisted that Central Asian countries should remain under Russia's privileged sphere. Although China remains careful to convey that it does not aim to replace Russia's privileged position in the region, Moscow still regards the Chinese expansion with some caution while also strengthening its ties with China. 
China's map. From the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 until the global financial crisis in 2008, the U.S. approach to economic management had been generally accepted and approved, but the Great Recession highlighted its flaws and, as China described it, it blew up in the heart of capitalism. For China, its state-managed economy provided a strong alternative, especially that the country soon became the power that pulled the global economy out of the 2008 hole and helped it recover. As a result, China no longer had to look to the U.S. for financial or economic guidance. China believed that the financial crisis was a breaking point in U.S.-China relations that compelled the U.S. to regard it as its equal. Yet even today, the differences in the oil field between the two nations remain stark. 75% of China's petroleum is imported, something that Beijing regards as a serious vulnerability and is a leading driver of China's strategic policies. China imports components from Vietnam, iron ore from Brazil, and soybeans from Iowa, but inevitably its main imports concern energy. Energy has formed the basis of China's increasing economic growth, and in 2009, China surged ahead of the U.S., becoming the world's leading energy consumer. Today, China alone accounts for 25% of global energy consumption, and is the largest consumer of Persian Gulf oil. The Mideast Map and U.S. Involvement The confrontation between Iran, one of the main oil producers in OPEC, and Saudi Arabia, the leading OPEC oil producer, is a race for dominance over the Middle East. It's a struggle shaped by ideology, national interests, and a thirst for primacy. Oil is crucial in this struggle, and the consequences are therefore global. Saudi Arabia and Iran in fact regard one another with mutual scorn that is rarely silenced. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman describes Iran's current supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, as the Middle Eastern Hitler who aims to conquer the world. He genuinely believes that wherever there are troubles in the Middle East, Iran is somehow involved. Khamenei, in turn, labels the House of Saud as sinful idols of colonialism and arrogance, murderous heartless idiots and U.S. milk cows. It was the 1978 Iranian Revolution that drew the U.S. further into the Middle East, in a way that would shape U.S. foreign policy and leave a profound impact on the whole region. Nonetheless, America's involvement in the Middle East further deepened as Iraqi President Saddam Hussein violently consolidated his power in the region, destroyed his potential rivals, whether real or imaginary, and moved forward toward becoming the Arab world's leader. He aimed to reshape it. Iraq's abundant oil was what enabled Saddam to gain all that power. Since the start of the Iranian Revolution, Iraq had been a focus for Tehran. Its population, majorly Shiite, and the religious flow existing between both nations made it the main target for expanding the revolution. Even after Hussein's fall in 2003, a battle for resources and power persisted between the two countries. Shia and Sunni militias brutally fought for power and the war's spoils, as Iran was provided with an opening in Iraq. Iran sought to keep Iraq divided and subject to its control, while assuring Shiite domination. Thus, Iraq could become the Arab platform through which Iran would spread its ideology and confront Gulf states, especially the Sunni Saudi Arabia. The Iranian Project With the Arab Spring, the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia became a direct confrontation, especially in Bahrain. The safety of oil was critical, and although Bahrain is small, it remains a strong link in the deadlock between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It is connected to the Saudi Kingdom through an 18-mile causeway and also represents a possible bridge through which Iran can extend its strength to the Gulf. In fact, since the start of the Arab Spring in 2011, certain parts of Bahrain's Shiite population have integrated with Iran's resistance axis. With several successful interventions such as its solid presence in Lebanon through Hezbollah, Iran has sought to secure a land bridge all the way from Iraq across Syria and into Lebanon, a route that facilitates the exchange of equipment, weapons and fighters. Iran's tactics have also allowed it to build underground factories for weapons along this whole route. It is currently aiming to strengthen its military presence on the northern Israeli borders, and Hezbollah would provide it with great support in confronting Israel. This is just one of the major steps that Iran can take, for any action on its part would increase the inevitability and likelihood of an Iranian-Israeli war. The Future of the Auto Industry over the last few years, many promising forecasts for electric cars have been made. Most of them have been quite optimistic in comparison with what's actually happened. 
Electric cars might be appealing to buyers, given their newness, coolness, or the message they deliver regarding the climate. It might also be that their buyers get regulatory or financial incentives from the government. Yet it remains unclear how the electric car is overall superior to the gasoline car. They are both still cars. So far, this has been a story of cars versus cars and electricity versus gasoline, yet a potential revolution might be at hand. In fact, much will change in the oil and auto industries once the future is no longer about having a car, but rather about hailing a car. The auto industry, like oil, is an international business. What really counts is not only what happens in Europe, Japan, or the United States, and despite all the efforts exerted in China to reduce congestion, having a car remains a powerful aspiration. For the international automobile industry, the future is puzzling, and as it is unfolding really fast, the basis on which the industry is established will be the foundation of growth in new markets and replacement in old ones. The Climate Question Mapping the road toward a lower carbon future is a decisive challenge that humanity and world powers will be facing in upcoming decades. Climate change has been the subject of serious studies for nearly 40 years. Yet the mobilization of public opinion on this topic is quite recent, incited not just by research, but also by an increasing focus on global events and natural disasters, heat waves, hurricanes, melting ice, forest fires, and droughts. Climate change alarm is the main force behind energy transition. This term is widely accepted and used the most in talks about the future of energy. Energy transition seeks to keep rises in temperature under 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial averages. Yet beyond this, there seems to be no consensus. The idea of energy transition is not new. It has been going on for years and unfolding over time. Previous waves of energy transition were mainly driven by economics, technology, convenience, ease, and environmental considerations, while today's energy transition is affected by policy, activism, and politics. Energy and finance have formed a new climate arena. The alarm was first sounded in 2015 by Mark Carney, the former Bank of England governor, who stated that climate had become a defining matter for financial stability. According to Carney, climate had caused a systemic risk for the global financial system. He raised the issue that insurers and investors faced the danger that gas and oil companies' reserves would stay in the ground, unable to find a market due to a drastic decrease in demand. Climate has become a top policy tool in many nations too. The UK declared that it would commit to reaching zero carbon emissions by 2050. Around 24 other countries are pledging the same, though the road for most of them remains unclear. A Promising Future China's transformation, India's moves toward an open economy, and the Soviet Union's collapse have together added more than 2.5 billion people to the global economy, creating opportunities and connections that had been previously deemed impossible. The outcome was a move toward a collaborative world order highly dependent on a globally connected economy, facilitated by communication, the internet, transportation advances, and an increasing flow of knowledge, skills, capital, and people. These phenomena, labeled as globalization, were all fueled by energy. Now though, the momentum is reversing and the world is witnessing an increase in competition, struggle for power, distrust, resentment, and suspicion. Globalization won't disappear, but it is growing more fragmented and contentious, and increasing trouble along the already tough road to economic growth. In such a system, oil will remain an international commodity and the primary fuel that pushes the world forward. Oil and gas will continue to play a leading role in the global economy and will be a central topic in debates on climate, environment, and international strategies. The map will never show a straight line, but certain disruptions can be surely anticipated. Author Style Daniel Jurgen's writing is informative, well-researched, and concise. He recounts historical events that have shaped global politics and provides insightful information on each region's energy background. The new map features photographs, maps of North America, the Middle East, and Europe, and a notes section.